Mr. Carter, Doc Williams, record date November 19th, 1975, and dedicated to Steve Torrance. Times with wish that she'd wed my old brown 
Well, let's stop now and listen for uh, just a moment to some of that recording you made in 1949. Then we can talk some more about it. There's 40 summers o'er my head. There's riches in my store. My children play out on the green. My wife stands in the door. I've land enough, I've money enough, I've houses tall and high. There's not a squire in all this land can wear such clothes as I. Striking thing about that piece for me is uh, is that nice uh, fiddle and accordion duet sound that you got in the accompaniment. And I think that's your brother Cy Williams playing fiddle and uh, right. Marion Martin uh, on the accordion. It has a tremendously kind of a ring of Eastern Europe to it. Do you think? I would say so. Uh, it is a style all our own. We perfected with my brother Cy Williams and Marion Martin. Marion Martin, by the way, uh, of course is. Uh, Kiyoshi's his last name. And what's your real name? And my, where are you my, from? my real name is S M I K, which means fiddle bow in the Czechoslovakian language. And your parents Both came from? Both were immigrants from Czechoslovakia. And when did they come? The Austria, Austro Hungarian, Austria Hungary, they called it the Empire huh. at that time. And, and and what year did they come to America? My dad came over about the year of 1909. And settled in? Settled in uh, the Cleveland, Ohio, Brecksville, Ohio, Salem, Ohio, a little village there. We met my mom. She came over when she was 12, and they were married. Uh, and I was the first born. And let's see, though, you really grew up in western Pennsylvania, I think. Near Catanning. And uh, what kind of work did your father do in that? My father was a coal miner and uh, a barber, a part-time barber, a good barber, and uh, supplemented his income during the Depression years with that. And I think uh, when you got a little older and started to work, you also uh, did some coal mining. Well, I certainly did. I, uh, three years. And was that good paying work? Oh, you better believe it. I worked every day, six days a week, never saw daylight for six months, got a dollar a day. A dollar Sometimes a day. Sometimes I worked two days for nothing. <laughs> and uh, so, in order to improve that dollar a day, what did you do? I went into the music business. And how did that work out? Made a dollar a day. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what kind of music work did you do? What was the first work that paid you money playing music? Well, back in the Depression years is when exactly when I started, 1932, right in the middle of it. We played in Cleveland, Ohio. First, we started square dances around Catanning. Well, I didn't pay anything. So I went to Cleveland and uh, worked in the, uh, what they call the beer garden. And uh, where you could get a bottle uh, of 30 ounces of beer for a nickel. Of course, naturally, selling beer for five cents for that much, uh, they couldn't pay much money either, so they paid me a dollar a night. And uh, was this uh, what we would think of as, uh, let's call it, square dance music, or did you play some polka? No, we, we sang at that time. We sang typical country songs at the time, like Red River Valley, uh, Cowboy Jack, and Birmingham Jail. Those were the big hits of it. And uh, then I guess your career got you on a number of radio stations, right? You must have worked on a half a dozen or so? Well, I, I first started in Cleveland, Ohio, in WJY. I wanted a watershed all over the country at that time. Later, I moved to Pittsburgh. Started on KQV, WJS, and WHAB Greens were the three-way hookup. But I first worked with uh, a, a lady who had a band, Miss Billy Walker. Uh, she was from Kentucky. And a uh, big friend of the Lone Cowboy, well known performer to many people. Uh, I got some valuable experience there in uh, how to do a radio show properly uh, uh, on the air, you know, live. 
And finally, when she left, I moved into her spot on Casey Z. I bet he had some dream work. Now, of course, uh, most people associate you with the uh, Jamboree shows on the wheeling station, WWZA. When did you start there? I started there in 1937. Of course, that was my, what we have to call my first big break, because uh, we went 50,000 watts in 1941. We covered the northeastern section of the United States like uh, blanket. We went into Newfoundland like a local station. We went into Greenland and all the way up to the Eskimo lands of the far north in Canada. And of course, uh, I made personal appearance in those area, and uh, they, you couldn't take care of the crowd. And let's see, so just before the Second World War, then, you start on Wheeling, and it was about that same time that you met and married your wife, right? My, uh, my wife was a uh, West Virginia girl, Pennsylvania girl, and uh, her name was Kroop. K-R-U-C-P is the correct spelling, German, Dutch ancestry, and um, but she, they spell it Kroop, K-R-U-P, in you know, the Riddles in her area, and uh, we met in May 1939. She sang, and sang well enough, I thought, to uh, warrant a chance to try to sing on the show, and she proved it. Uh, capacity to do that by getting five or six encores all in one night. <laughs> well, I gotta marry this girl, I gotta hire her. <laughs> well, I'd like now to uh, listen again to uh, a bit of the first record that uh, you and your group made, and it's one that features Chicky singing solo, made in 1947. It's one that has both a song and a recitation in it called Beyond the Sunset. This song, um, the song, the story should be told. It was recorded during the Christmas season of 1947 in Cleveland on the old disc cutters, no tape machines then. And uh, we got it in desperation and because we knew we had a hit, but no one wanted. None of the major companies would want a sacred number with a recitation. We said nobody will buy it. So we invested our life savings into the first record, sent it to radio stations in New York, WR in New York, Baltimore. Washington, D.C., Richmond, Virginia, and that's what made a hit in the biggest uh, metropolitan areas in the United States, right in New York City, it jammed up the switchboard. Then all the record companies very frantically tried to get the rights for Leaf the Master. Beyond the sun. So that's Beyond the Sunset, a uh, song and recitation by your wife, Chicky Williams, from about 1947. And as you said, the first record that your own record company put out, one that uh, had to be put out in a way because the major companies wouldn't touch it, I think it was such a success, though, wasn't it, that other artists have also performed that song? It's been recorded many, many, uh, literally hundreds of times by others. And so the idea somehow that the record companies are out of touch in a way with what the people want themselves makes me think that you've had, well, that difficulty and others. Have you not had uh, problems in integrating yourself into the musicians' union at one point? We certainly did. That was a very serious problem back in the early days of our Jamboree history and feeling. Our local union uh, would not recognize us as a musician. That's common knowledge. 
Uh, and uh, they said we didn't read music. Of course, today they're very happy to have all of us. Uh, that did impede us in many ways because it denied us uh, making recordings. Uh, we couldn't go on network shows, uh, coast to coast, and many other things. So there are many problems. Fortunately, I, I hope that we're heading in a direction away from that. But then, then you see what I almost consider a monopoly in, in the record business. How does a local, regional artist who has tremendous talent, and today with fine taping facilities and recording studios, you can hire the finest musicians in the land and make the finest record, and then the local people will say, local stations will say, well, we don't want to play them, they're local. So, so there's a, another kind of a branch of the establishment, you might say, that also interferes or impedes artistry, we've the got stations the, themselves. We've got to beat down the doors all over again. It's a constant problem and a struggle to beat through that local area into the radio stations. And, uh, or even a station that has live artists, say, on a, on a Saturday night hayride-type program or something, may not even play those artists' own records during the week. That's correct, because uh, in, a, in a way, perhaps you're considered second-rate, I guess. You, uh, it, how else would I describe it? Uh, and yet we've got many fine artists, and they are not played. They, they, that's because of the tight 40 playlist. You repeat the same record every couple hours, wear it out until everybody's sensibilities are dulled, and then throw it out and throw in a new one, you know. Wear it out. <laughs> well, I'm surprised, you know, uh, when we think, then, that, that you've had troubles with companies, with unions, with stations, that you've, uh, you know, survived uh, nicely for the 40 years of your career. Uh, the big success must partly be... Uh, uh, where some of your audience is. I mean, where have you really hit it off well with the people directly? I was fortunate in being located in the northeastern part of the country, uh, the United States, a huge population area. We blanketed the area through a live show on the Jamboree. We could also cross the border, relatively simple at the time, uh, no papers even. If there was a crossover, work, pay our income taxes, and come back. Into Canada. Into Canada, that's right. As a result, we went into Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and we'd have monstrous crowds. Uh, and there was uh, nothing to impede us. Except we were doing it, this all to the detriment of the local Canadian performer who had the same problem we've got now. Hmm. And Parliament had to pass a law to get the Canadian performers on the air so they could do well in their music profession. Well, it seems to me, uh, looking again at the recordings that you've made in your career, that sometimes you've selected songs or done pieces in a way to cater to that Canadian audience. We certainly did. And, and in just a minute, I want to uh, take a listen to an excerpt of a tune called A Girl from Champlain. Was that a tune that you selected for Canadians? It's a Canadian tune originally called The Joys of Quebec. It's a very popular tune in Canada. Quit in. Uh, we had some members of the band write uh, lyrics to it. It was written about the village of Champlain, New York, which is on Cape Blank, Lake Champlain, right on the Quebec border. So the two just naturally go together. Huge French population in that area anyhow, in New York and in Quebec, of course. And we call the thing the girl from Champlain. Well, let's listen to a little bit of it now and pay special attention to my favorite part, which is the fine fiddle break that Al Cherney played oh, beautiful. on this recording made in 1966. In the village of Champlain lived a girl, Marie LaRue. Had a boyfriend tall and handsome, and he was back so true. All day he dreamed about her, and of a wedding day. And when he was around her, this was all that he could say. Ah, oh, my sweet, and there his voice would say, his heart was sad as she. And the words he could not say, ah, oh, my sweet, was all that he could say. And a tear would fill his eye. I love that piece, and I love that fiddle playing, and it's 
fascinating to me to learn that, that Al Cerny is, uh, is Ukrainian. You've right. been talking a little about your Czechoslovak background. Are there a lot of uh, people from East European ethnic groups in country music? There, there certainly is, and that's a, that's a thing we could uh, batter down again. In country music, there are many artists who are of uh, European ancestry. Uh, Smiley uh, Sutter, we call him, Slater, uh, is a Lithuanian. He played on some of my records, the harmonica. He's a Canadian. We call him Crazy Elmer. Uh, Dave Dudley of Poland. Uh, Mary Martin, who works the uh, Kodos Kory, is Polish, of course. Piotrowski. Uh, Pee Wee King is Polish. And Pee Wee King, of course, is the artist that had the big hits. Of and he's also in the Hall of Fame. Tennessee Waltz right, and uh, Slowpoke and some of those. Right. Well, let's listen to a tune now. Uh, it's a duet, an early duet that you and Chicky recorded called One Heart, One Life. And this tune features an instrumental accompaniment, Marion Martin on accordion and Smiley Sutter playing uh, right. along with and him. also a Frenchman, Ray Couture. <laughs> let's really get it, ethnic. Okay. So uh, here from uh, 1952 is One Heart, One Life. That's a nice duet there that you and Chicky sang. Uh, what's it? Uh, what's it like? Is it possible to be uh, to be married and work professionally with the same person? Well, in my particular case, it certainly has been because I've been married 36 years to the same woman, and that's uh, that's something I guess today. Uh, I think that the high divorce rate in uh, among show and professional people is because they don't have the same uh, community of interest. In other words, we work together, we, we've had three daughters, we've raised them, they're all adults, and uh, successful human beings, and uh, we, of course, have uh, combined uh, Chicky's career as a mother, if you want to call that a career, with, and it is, really, and also uh, an entertainer. She's been a professional entertainer with a hit record. Uh, I think that one of the reasons why we have a high divorce rate is uh, you're liable to be a movie star or a recording artist and be in California, and your wife might be in New York City and all overseas in England or, or goodness knows where. This doesn't make for marriage, and uh, of course, uh, many marriages uh, are split up just for that reason alone. Now, bringing your family into the act, of course, it just includes Chicky. I think at a very early age, the girls also came uh, on stage and started singing called Chickie's Little Chicks. I right. Think. The youngest was four years old, Karen. We called it, we called our daughters Super Peach and Pumpkin. They were little nicknames that we used at that time. And of course, uh, they uh, sang on the stage from the time they were four and about five and six. They, were, they all wound up like dominoes. And uh, they're at home on the stage even today. They just grew up in it. Do you think of that as a sort of a moral example about family life? Why, certainly. I would say very strongly the fact that uh, when they were little girls, they traveled with us in the summer months when they were out of school. We went to Canada together. We shared our problems and troubles, and they grew up, and they, uh, they knew how their parents lived. And well, they lived. you made uh, one record album of uh, sacred tunes with the three girls, which, of course, is also has strong moral implications. and. I think we ought to listen now to a tune from uh, that 1967 record with uh, 
Keeper and Punkin, I think, singing along with you on a tune called Be Still. Doc, it seems very fitting somehow to uh, sort of finish up this look at your career with uh, uh, a religious song and uh, a fairly recent recording, too. Now, we're used to the idea of pop stars coming and going in just a few weeks or months, uh, but uh, how is it for a country music artist? And uh, are you going to continue or thinking of retiring? I expect to be in it right to the very last day as I happen to be on this earth, and I hope that's quite some time to come. There's another little uh, bit of prejudice that we're fighting, too, uh, among all the population. That's the uh, prejudice of, of age. I'm 61, and I'm still active in country music. I work hard at it, but possibly harder than many people in my profession. I've never goofed around in it. I've never shortchanged my audience. and. Uh, I feel that's the secret ingredient of success in any field. Do the best you possibly can and then walk an extra mile. And that's exactly what I intend to keep right on doing. That's why I'm here right now. And why is it that uh, country music, I wonder, has artists whose careers go a long time? Because we identify with the family. We become family members in the heart, primarily those people. They, they live with us. I, I know I wish I could show you the thousands of letters I've received and the way they write. They write, write to me. They, they bear their hearts, their souls with it, and they tell me their troubles. I don't have time to answer all of them at times. I do the best I can. I've received so many of them. But they know when I talk to them on the air or in person, I'm communicating with them as well as with my father. <laughs> 